Welcome to the lecture 4. In the previous lecture, we introduced a framework of phylogenetic analysis, which could be used to discuss the origin of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. In this lecture, we are going to consider possible evolutionary pathways along which the bad infecting coronaviruses might have jumped to humans, how many jumps between various species it would require, and how probable this chain of events can be. In the second part, we are going to consider the question whether all humans may be equally susceptible to the new virus, or perhaps some individuals might be less susceptible to the infection due to our genetic diversity. This would lead us to a more general question of how genetically diverse the global human population is, say, in comparison with populations of coronaviruses or our closest animal cousins, chimpanzees. To answer these questions, we have to expand our phylogenetic analysis of linear nucleotide sequences into three-dimensional world of the encoded proteins. The first step in unraveling the mystery of SARS-CoV-2 zoonotic pathways is to reconstruct phylogenetic tree of the relatedness using only the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. To this end, we first use the complete spike protein gene sequences of four coronaviruses from the SARS-CoV-2 monophyletic group. To root the tree, we will use SARS-CoV-1 as an outgroup. Note that this dataset we have already used in the previous lecture. Here, we reconstruct the maximum likelihood tree and bootstrap it using the program MEGA. This tree shows that bat rat G13 is indeed cl the closest known relative of SARS-CoV-2, with pangolins being the more distant relatives. However, if we build the same tree using only human receptor binding domain of the spike protein, the pattern of relatedness is reversed. Now pangolins are more closely related to SARS-CoV-2 than bad rat G13. Actually, this observation forms the basis of the proposition that pangolins might serve as the intermediate host in zoonosis of SARS-CoV-2. In this scenario, the virus might have first jumped from bats to pangolins and then from pangolins to humans. The reason for that is a surmise that ACE2 receptor of pangolins is structurally closer to humans than bats to humans, thus providing a platform for virus adaptation. To understand that, we have to look at the human receptor and figure out how it is related to the receptor found in bats and pangolins. Let us watch a short video briefly describing the biological function of ACE2 protein. The virus responsible for COVID seeks out a specific surface protein molecular target to gain access to our cells called ACE2, which stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2, a transmembrane zinc metalloprotein found in the lungs, GI tract, kidneys, and blood vessels. Their distribution would explain some of the presenting symptoms of COVID, including respiratory and GI distress, renal failure, and dementia. However, the clinical response spectrum to SARS-CoV-2 is quite broad ranging from completely asymptomatic to death, suggesting variability in either the configuration or number of ACE2 targets from individual to individual. Over the next few minutes, we're going to look at the actual function of the ACE2 metalloprotein in our bodies and explore some of the clinical situations that may make the protein a more suitable target for COVID. To understand the function of ACE2, we first have to review the renin-angiotensin system, involving the kidneys, liver, lungs, blood vessels, and adrenals, the renin-angiotensin system is a closed-loop feedback mechanism that helps maintain renal blood flow. The kidneys are designed to filter the nitrogen waste products of protein metabolism from our bodies. To function normally, they need a steady flow of blood, receiving about 25% of the total cardiac output. A drop in blood pressure, either systemically from heart failure or locally from a narrowing of the renal artery supplying blood to the kidney, causes the kidney to secrete a chemical called renin into the bloodstream. Renin then links to a protein hormone produced in the liver called angiotensinogen, converting it to angiotensin 1. A second enzyme produced in the lungs, called angiotensin-converting enzyme, or ACE, then links to angiotensin 1, converting it to angiotensin 2, the active configuration of the hormone. 
angiotensin II then acts on both the peripheral arteries throughout the body and the adrenal glands. The arteries constrict, and the adrenal glands produce another hormone called aldosterone, which causes the kidneys to resorb more salt and water from the urine. The combination of vascular constriction and salt water retention raises the systemic blood pressure and restores blood flow to the compromised kidney. So, just to summarize, decreased blood flow to the kidney causes the kidney to secrete the enzyme renin. Renin acts on a hormone precursor from the liver called angiotensinogen, converting it to angiotensin 1. A second enzyme produced in the lungs, called ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, acts on angiotensin 1, converting it to angiotensin 2, the active form of the hormone. Angiotensin 2 then acts on both the arteries and adrenal glands, causing constriction of the peripheral blood vessels of the arms and legs, and secretion of another hormone from the adrenals called aldosterone. Aldosterone causes the kidneys to absorb salt and water from the urine. The combination of vasoconstriction and salt water retention increases blood pressure and restores blood flow to the kidney. Now with this information, I can show you how the renin-angiotensin system is related to our ACE2 membrane protein that the coronavirus uses to locate and infect particular cells in our body for reproduction. First, let's stylize our cell membrane model and restore an intact ACE2 membrane protein. The active form of ACE2 is produced by an additional enzyme called Shedase. Shedase cleaves the external component of the ACE2 protein and releases it into the bloodstream. The cleaved ACE2 then interacts with angiotensin 2, converting it into angiotensin 1-7. Angiotensin 1-7 is a powerful antioxidant and vasodilator. Dilating the peripheral vessels of the body and eliminating the action of angiotensin 2 on the adrenals, angiotensin 1-7 lowers blood pressure and is basically the counterbalance to the renin-angiotensin system. There are medications that also counteract the effects of the renin-angiotensin system, including angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, or ACEIs, and angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs. ACEIs are just like they sound, blocking angiotensin-converting enzyme from transforming angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin receptor blockers are also descriptive, working on the system a little further down the line, blocking angiotensin II from binding to its receptors on the blood vessels and adrenal glands. During the early days of the pandemic, there was some concern that both ACEIs and ARBs could increase the risk of a viral infection by upregulating the expression of the ACE2 surface proteins throughout the body. However, preliminary data has shown just the opposite. COVID-19 patients on angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers do much better with decreased all-cause mortality if they stay on their blood pressure medications during their infection. Whether this is due to lessening the impact of the infection itself or simply preventing death from the complications of hypertension is currently not clear and more research is needed. As we discussed, the two dominant active hormone configurations in the renin-angiotensin system are angiotensin II and angiotensin I-7. Angiotensin II raises blood pressure in response to limited blood flow to the kidneys and appears to have inflammatory and atherogenic properties, meaning it causes plaques to form in the vessels of our body. Angiotensin 1-7, on the other hand, lowers blood pressure and appears to have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects, reducing atherosclerotic disease in our vessels. As you can see, these two key hormones are in direct competition, and the dominant species is probably determined by the individual's baseline health status. In young, healthy, and physically fit individuals, angiotensin 1-7 is king. However, in a sedentary, elderly individual with heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, and a poor diet, angiotensin 2 would rule. Of course, in a situation where angiotensin 1-7 is the dominant hormone, we would expect Shedase to be working overtime, cleaving the external component of the ACE2 metalloprotein and thereby converting angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1-7. Finally, let's assume the spike protein on the SARS-CoV-2 viral particle specifically recognizes the intact transmural ACE2 protein on our cell membranes. In healthy individuals, with an abundance of angiotensin 1-7, most of the ACE2 proteins would have been cleaved, reducing the number of potential viral gateways into our cells and limiting the chance of the cytoplasm reaching that genetic critical mass. However, 
In the chronically ill patient, where angiotensin II dominates, most of the ACE2 surface proteins would remain intact, allowing many viral particle entry points, increasing the likelihood of a fulminant COVID infection. The binding and deformation of the intact proteins by coronavirus may further reduce the availability of the ACE2 enzyme, increasing vascular inflammation resulting in the local thrombosis of arteries in the body, which could explain the findings of stroke and ischemia in the fingers and toes in some patients. If this all turns out to be true, exogenous shed ACE enzyme may be a powerful medication in the treatment of both hypertension and a SARS-CoV-2 infection. The 2020 science paper reports several high-resolution cryo-electron microscopy structures of the full-length human angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, or ACE2. It is solved as a complex with the amino acid transporter B081, as well as a ternary complex with the receptor binding domain, or RBD, of SARS-CoV-2. The ACE2 complex exists as a dimer that is reflected in this picture as the left to right symmetry. In the absence of RBD, the structure is rather dynamic, fluctuating between open and closed conformations. RBD binding fixes the closed conformation. Each monomer in itself is a heterodimer, consisting on one ACE2 molecule, colored in light blue, and one B081 molecule, colored in pink. One receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2, highlighted in green, is located on the top of the heterodimer. These structures reveal the molecular details of the interactions between viral spike protein and the human receptor. Each PD domain of ACE2 accommodates one viral receptor binding domain. The overall interface is mediated mainly through polar interactions. An extended loop region of the RBD spans the arch-shaped alpha helix 1 of ACE2 like a bridge. The contacts can be divided into three clusters. The two ends of the bridge interact with the N and C termini of the alpha helix 1, as well as the small areas on an adjacent helix and a loop. The middle segment of alpha helix 1 reinforces the interactions by engaging two more polar residues. At the end terminus of alpha helix 1, three polar residues of RBD form a network of hydrogen bonds with four residues of ACE2. In the middle of the bridge, two residues from each side form a pair of hydrogen bonds. At the C-terminus of the helix, a glutamine of RBD is hydrogen bonded to a glutamine of ACE2, whereas phalanine of RBD interacts with methionine of ACE2 through Van der Waals forces. In summary, the structure of viral spike protein with human ACE2 shows that the pairwise interactions of only 7 to 8 amino acids from each side define the specificity of viral interactions, enabling the cross-species jumps. In the following quiz, we will take a closer look at mapping of these interactions to the amino acid sequence alignments across different species. In the next part of the lecture, we are going to explore the patterns of these interactions in several species to define possible zoonotic pathways of the coronavirus in the context of the main question of its origin. Mm -hmm.